Mr. Ernst, I'd like to welcome you to today's keynote. Uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce a friend, personal friend, friend to Seneca, uh, but also a good friend of open source and the open web. Mark Sermon is the executive director of the Mozilla Foundation. And I, I was trying to uh, think about when I, I actually started working with Mark or when I met him. And I, and it's, it's been a long time. It's been, uh, he and I have been working together on stuff since about 2007, 2000, mm -hmm. yep. 2006, 2007. And uh, I think he'll talk probably about some of his different things he's been working on in open source. But uh, when I first met him, he was thinking about open source and open education, and uh, I think working with the Shuttleworth Foundation at the time. And he's really stayed true to those roots. So a lot of his work has been, in the context of Mozilla, thinking about how do you enable uh, communities and networks of, of people who want to think about open technology, think about the open web, think about how to bring that to uh, another generation. How do you teach that? How do you spread that around the world? He's had a really good vehicle to do that in his role at the, at the foundation, and, um, traveling the world and, and really building a lot of excitement for the open web and uh, open source in general. So I, I'll introduce him now. Please help me in welcoming Mark uh, as he talks to us this morning. Mark. Dave. Thanks, Dave. And Chris, can you give me a, like, I'm going to try to talk for about half an hour, so maybe give me a five minutes at 25 minutes, and we'll try to have time for questions. We'll see how it goes. Uh, so thanks for the kind welcome, uh, and thank you guys for having me here. Uh, hello. hello. Thank you. Um, Chris, as you know, the, the theme is 30 years of freedom, uh, which really that was 2013 when the, the GNU public license um, turned 30. Uh, so on that theme of 30 years of freedom, bleh, on that theme, I've got to get talking here, uh, Chris sort of gave me that as something to riff on. So I started with 30 years of freedom as my theme. And then as I kind of had a couple glasses of wine at dinner last night here at the speaker's dinner, I realized that was not ambitious enough. So today's talk is entitled 350 Years of Freedom. Um, which is, I think, what we are going to try to build here together. And before I get into the talk, I want to just do a couple quick polls. So how many people here are in some way involved in free software and open source? OK, that's, there's people here who are not. You're either lazy or you're in the wrong conference. Uh, and uh, how many people, you know, there's a lot of pragmatic reasons for being involved in, in free software and open source. You just, if you're here, hearing Kieran and uh, Gideon talk, there's economic reasons. There's, you know, open source lets you get ahead by leveraging other people's codes. There's lots of reasons. But for me, there's also values reasons. So another poll is how many people are involved in free and open source software because they, they see it resonate with their values? All right, almost as many people, even the guy who didn't have his hand up the first time. So that's good. You're more a kind of activist. Um, and then just a last quick question is, how many, a lot of people don't identify this way, how many people see themselves as a part of a free software or open source movement? A smaller group of people. Okay, well, you people, let's have a drinks afterwards. Um, so I'm gonna talk about sort of my values, the idea of values in something pragmatic like open source and how they can actually shape the world in deep and meaningful, lasting ways. And I'm gonna start 355 years ago. Um, does anybody have a guess who's in this picture or what this is going on in here? American Not at all. Oh, close. No, you said American science? Uh, science. No, not, no. It is, in fact, Isaac Newton is in here. Uh, and this is an early meeting of the Royal Society of London, which is, if you don't know, preeminent scientific organization. They have many great, uh, famous scientists who have been fellows of the Royal Society. And is one of the institutions um, that really was there at the founding of modern Western science. I mean, these guys who set this thing up, you know, at a time of alchemy, a time of pervasive religion, religious control over sort of how society worked, uh, you know, where there wasn't space for science, they were crazies. Uh, you know, they were radicals. They, were, they had a set of values and ideals that were different than almost everybody in the society around them. And uh, they still exist today. I, I was there talking to them about computer science curriculum at, at the offices in London a couple of years ago. And, 
it still says over the door in Latin, take no one's word for it, which was a radical phrase at the time to say, look for evidence. And what's interesting to me is not that. I mean, science has not done only good in the world. It's also done bad. I'm not saying the science is the be all and end all. But it is something that I believe is valuable. But more important, that institution, those people who are just people like us, sow the seeds of something that really has shaped humanity. And that institution is still there 355 years later with people who still share the values of those founders and still believe their purpose is to carry that movement forward and to have science continue to benefit humanity. And I think when I think about free software that the ideas that I believe in in free software are as important as the ideas that gave us science. The idea that the information is something that can belong to all of us, that we can build on top of each other, that is something that can have a multi-hundred year impact on who we become as humanity. And I actually also worry that if those ideals don't shape where we go, the other direction is, is not a good one. So I start with this to say, we've, we're only 30 years in. We've got another 325 to go uh, to you know, get where we are today with science. And I, I actually do believe we have the chance to do it. There also are a number of things uh, that are already getting in the way. So let me take you to, oh, actually, that's not 30 years ago. It's a little bit, well, it's probably actually about 30 years ago. When was that, 1998, 1988? Anyways, um, so that's me. Um, that's my high school year yearbook photo. Um, <laughs> And this is actually interesting because it's a, it's a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy because they wouldn't let me put that in the high school yearbook because I had a cigarette in my mouth. Um, and so I had a photocopy of them and hand them out for people to paste them in. Um, <laughs> so always hacking publishing is one of the things I've done my whole life. Um, and anyways, you know, that, at that time, obviously, I was a punk rock kid. I was involved in the peace movement. I was the peak, peak of the Cold War. Um, and values have always been important to me. And in particular, something that I, is in kindred to free software is this DIY ethic. The idea that you know, coming out of the 70s, only big corporations really could make music. That's what punk rock was standing up against. And saying, you can do it yourself. You can get a four track tape recorder. You can pick up a guitar even if you can't play it. You can do it. You can make a magazine, which is actually what I did. Is I was a zine guy, not a musician. And that ethic maybe feels, especially for free software people, pervasive today. But that was actually a big deal in the 70s as punk rock comes up to say we can do it ourselves. It's not culture, creativity, communication are not only something that should be controlled by very centralized, wealthy corporations. And so I've always believed that. And I think that's actually something that Richard Stallman believed as well. Oh, wait, what happened? Um, 30 years ago when he wrote this. Um, I, I guess some people know what this is, but this is the first two paragraphs of his announcement that he was going to create GNU. And actually, you should go read the whole thing. It, it has lots of really beautiful stuff about how contribution works, lots of very typical, egotistical, insecure Stallman stuff, <laughs> like all of the kind of Stallman stuff, the, the beauty and the horror. Um, uh, oh, I was going to make a very bad Stallman joke. I just held it in. Um, but I, you know, I, I think this really was the idea um, that he was going to do it himself. And if you go and scroll down, he was inviting others to do it with him, to create a completely free version of Unix. And you know, love him or hate him, and I think most people have mixed feelings, he really seeded that idea. And seeded what I think even beyond the do-it-yourself piece, and it's related, what I see as the core of the movement that I see myself belonging to and that I see Mozilla belonging to, that in a world where computing is becoming pervasive, I'm looking for my prop, it's in my pocket, um, you know, in this world, um, can we actually have a situation where we fully control our devices, our data, and the things that actually shape our lives now? In a world where we're going to have 5 billion people on the internet within 10 years, that actually matters. That becomes an issue of where humanity goes. Do we control these or do we not? 
And you'll notice that this is a very uncontrollable device in my hand. Uh, it is not a Firefox phone. Um, and in many ways, while Stallman is inspiring, while we are doing a lot of great work, things are not going as well as they need to for us to be really able to control these over the next 325 years. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about where we've had some victories, Mozilla in particular. I'll give you a little Mozilla history, where I think we've lost some ground, both Mozilla and all of us, and how I think we invest more deeply our energy in the right direction to build the next 325 years of freedom. And so I think of, and this, of course, for those who are historians will know as a point of controversy, think of Mozilla very much as of the free software movement, or at least you know, very much born in its milieu. And so this is you know, one of the great moments of it being born is Netscape decides to release the code as open source, I guess in 98. It's got a date on there. Yes, I'm correct. Um, and I can tell funny stories over drinks about how that happened, because I, I know some of the people involved. Uh, I was not anywhere around. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a thing that may be hard to imagine from this moment in time, but here is a successful at the moment publicly traded company who is looking into this chaotic free software movement, which is still very much Stallman-esque. The words open source are just really getting invented at that time. Those little religious wars are starting. And this public company says, we're getting hammered by Microsoft. Let's actually put the code out there as a competitive strategy. And like, let's go join with this crazy group of free software people. That was what happened then, which was quite a radical move on the part of the people inside of Netscape. And what it unlocked years later was the idea that became Firefox. So this is Phoenix, uh, which I guess is 2003. Does it have a copyright date on there? Um, it says 2002, which was the first fork of the Mozilla suite that spun out of Netscape to just be a browser. The intent behind it was to make a very fast browser uh, you know, without all of the email, newsgroup, HTML editor stuff, just something fast and good to take on Internet Explorer, which eventually, uh, a year and a half later or so, gets released as Firefox 1.0. And you know, what's interesting is, how many people have ever used Firefox? I know many of you committed, moved to Chrome. I don't, as long as you share our values, I don't care. Um, and uh, you know, what comes of that is something that you can trace from you know, Stallman's movement um, inspiring manifesto and release of GNU through to Netscape's action, which I think is quite innovative in the part of, of a public company, through to a, a fork of the product, which was actually contentious at the time, to something that becomes a consumer product that all of us have used and really instantiates those values in that movement for hundreds of millions of people, even if they don't know it. And so this is actually a little bit of the history of how it evolves. That the, uh, it doesn't go up to date. But you know, it's actually, you can see in there, more than five years where the people are struggling along to kind of innovate. And like there's an open source community that people are using this Mozilla suite but it has not taken off as a consumer product. And you know, really, two things happen in order for that takeoff to happen. One is that kind of grinding down. How many people actually, to pick up another theme from Kieran, Kieran and Gideon's talk, how many people have ever had a, a software project that has either failed or never had impact? Really, there's a lot of very successful people in here, or people who have never written code. Um, so it's, it's a common thing that, you know, any kind of project, but software projects don't take off like that. And it really was that persistence that mattered, as well as an insight, let's just make the browser, uh, take away the suite, do something consumers want, as well as another factor, is that once it got to that point, people were so angry about Microsoft, the product itself was so good that a movement actually formed around Firefox. Or maybe that's the wrong point that a phrase a, a colleague of mine uses, it, it's the product the movement needed. And so what this is is actually um, the New York Times ad when Firefox 1.0 comes out, which was not paid for by Mozilla Foundation, but was 10,000 people, all of whom donated to buy a quarter million dollar ad in the New York Times 
to say, this is a new moment in time, make a choice, we have an independent browser. And it was that sense of movement, that sense that something bigger was going on than a product that made that spike happen just as much as the product itself. And I kind of put those things together because to me that is the formula that we have used, Mozilla, but I think we have all used in bringing open source and free software much closer to the mainstream. When you talk about a free software product, you think about back to 1983, the imagine a free software product is a consumer product for hundreds of millions of people, and that many of them, large, large number of them, feel an emotional affinity of it, even if they don't really know what open source and free software is, but because they think it has some special values, and we know that to be true, that's a huge achievement. And to me, that formula to get there is these three things. The innovation, the invention, whether that's a business invention, of releasing your code as open source as a public company, or some of the, the technology innovations behind Firefox that push the web forward, as well as something that people can grab and relate to and use every day, normal people, not just programmers. And then the idea of a movement, that this is a social force, that we are trying to change and shape where the world goes through what we do with this software, or through what we do with anything, frankly. I think this is an important formula. But this is what worked for Mozilla, worked for all of us in bringing open and free somewhere closer to the mainstream. So how has it been going since, say, 2007 on our last graph? Not as good as we would like, um, which I'm not, you know, I'm not shy to say. I'm going to kind of look at how things are. So this is, a, this is actually kind of ugly graph. I looked at a bunch of ones to include last night. But this is the best one, because obviously you see Firefox declining a little bit. We haven't become irrelevant by any stretch. We're the orange line, unsurprisingly. Um, you see Chrome, which is the green line, you know, shooting up because Google made a great product, uh, but also because they've spent like billions, I think actually literally billions, but certainly more than a billion in advertising uh, on, on Chrome and are incredibly aggressive. Microsoft becoming, you know, far less relevant than it was, not irrelevant, Safari coming up. But what's also interesting is that purple line, which is mobile versus desktop browsing. Um, so the other thing that has happened at the same time as we haven't kept pace against Chrome, there's been that, their pressure is, the other real pressure is mobile be starting to replace desktop in percentage of time that people spend on the internet. And of course, mobile is not primarily, although this is changing a little bit. Um, oh, actually, sorry. I want to say one thing before I say that. Um, the other stat to look at is, if you actually look at operating systems, we're, act, we're in a world that is becoming closer to Windows, with Android playing Windows, uh, than many of us actually think. And I think it's dangerous. So it's not true here, where Android is about 60-some percent of market share. But in most of the emerging markets of the world, that's the split between Android and everything else. And Apple is not present in those markets for all intents and purposes. And so we're moving to mobile. We're also moving back into a, a monopoly setting, very much like the, the Windows setting, as we grow to 5 billion people on the internet. So in terms of how it's going right now, Mozilla is you know, struggling with its relevance as our desktop browser declines. People are moving to mobile, which is a good thing. I love being on mobile. But back into a, a centralized monopoly economy. Um, and I guess you know that you might say, well, that's not so bad. We're an open source conference. Um, you know, isn't Android open source? It's the first Android phone, the G1. And I remember I got to play with one by somebody who was developing it at a O'Reilly Foo, um, Foo camp in probably 98 or whenever it came out. And it was so exciting. There's going to be this open source smartphone. And like, this is awesome. And I remember like, I ordered one as early as uh, possible. And it has not, of course, worked out that way. Um, yes, there is Linux, and there are a lot of open source components behind Android. We use a lot of them to build Firefox OS. But Google has built a vertically integrated stack. So when we think about that 91% market share in, uh, in India, they built a vertically integrated stack, which put them in a position of controlling our use of computing and how the market works in a way that's far, far, far 
more pervasive than Microsoft ever was on the desktop because they don't only control the operating system, uh, which you could take the core components of it and use on your own, and many in China do to great effect because they don't care about the legal constraints. But if you want to include maps or anything of the Google Play services, you are incredibly locked down on what you can do with the operating system. And then if you're a consumer and you wanted to choose anything other than Google's payment systems, Google's maps, Google's identity system, which you have to have to functionally use the phone, or if you're a developer and you want to get something distributed and you don't want to distribute it through the Play Store, you're mostly out of luck. You can do some of those things, but the whole thing is a vertically integrated, centralized system all the way up and down the stack with only the most minimal substrate being open. So we're now back in a spot from a, a time where we had started to make open mainstream, uh, where at the consumer level, we're really seeing a shift back into monopolies. We're seeing folks like Mozilla and even folks like Wikipedia, who are the, the kind of stellar consumer open source examples, really struggling. And then at the same time, uh, as the world goes mobile, even the internet starts to disappear into the background, which of course is the greatest open source invention of them all. Um, this is a story from Quartz Magazine, which is, is actually a fun um, online site, where they discovered, and we, we actually discovered through some field research before them and some others did, and then they went out and did some polling to validate this. Um, that in emerging markets, uh, a lot of Facebook users, including early you know, people who got their first smartphones, don't know that the internet even exists. So they have a smartphone, they have an internet-enabled device, but you go and you interview them, which we've done in a bunch of our field research, and we say, do you use the internet on that device? And they say, well, uh, what's the internet? And they say, well, do you use that for anything other than phone calls? Oh, well, I use it for Facebook. And there literally is no sense that anything exists beyond that. So we, you know, they're using a lockdown smartphone that only has Google on it, and they don't know that there are any apps other than Facebook. And of course, they may know, many people know there's a few more, but it's a very closed economy, a much more closed economy for most people digitally uh, than was the case 10 years ago. Windows was a very open platform in many ways compared to this, because anybody can install software just from a floppy disk or a CD. And then the, the last, oh, I guess I have two last things that kind of, this is my, my moment of woe. Um, you know, we've tried to fix this a little bit in the last three or four years, if you've been watching. So we came out with the operating system, Firefox OS for smartphones, uh, now on televisions. Um, and it has not succeeded so far. Uh, and I would say, if I'm being honest, we're kind of going back to the drawing board to say, how do we succeed? How do we enter into the mobile market? It's not easy. It's not easy at all. And it's not for lack of trying. It's not for lack of partners and telephone carriers all around the world. We're not a tiny startup who's just trying to enter that nobody's ever heard of. It's not for lack of big announcements at Mobile World Congress. We haven't been able to put a dent in this increasingly closed, stratified environment of mobile. So it's not that optimistic, but you know, we're there, we're the movement, we believe in it, we're gonna keep going, right? But then you know, things like this happen, where even our allies, uh, it's hard for us to keep those alliances. And so this is uh, a decision I certainly stand by, that we put EME, we, we put basically standards-based DRM in Firefox. We didn't have a choice because we'd be basically taking Firefox away from anybody who wanted to watch YouTube or Netflix uh, if we hadn't put it in. It was the right decision because we were not gonna convince the technology industry not to put DRM in web standards. But it means that our relationship to that movement becomes strained. And I would say in general, both for reasonable reasons like this and also for silly reasons in terms of where we put our energy, we have not stayed as tightly tied into the movement that I believe and we believe we're, we're from as we were when we first took off uh, in 2004 and 2005. So, you know, if we're trying to get to 325 more years of freedom, uh, I think about Mozilla's situation, but also the situation of the world, we have moved, I think, back 
to some degree from where we were 10 years ago or five years ago uh, even. It's not that we aren't succeeding. It's not that we are not all having impact. And certainly, free software and open source runs huge parts of the internet, you know, uh, you know runs most of the internet companies you, you know. So from an infrastructure perspective, free software is being, continues to be incredibly uh, successful. From a shaping a consumer experience, are we able to control this part of our lives? Things are not going as well as we need them to go. So, uh, you know, I, I worry that we don't have enough of these three things in this formula, and, and it makes me wonder, you know, how long do we keep this run going, and do we actually build these values into humanity and society in the way that science has? I still believe we can and must, especially because the future we're going to get is a very closed, surveilled, centralized one if we do not. Uh, that's why I care about this as a movement as well as a pragmatic uh, thing. Um, but we need to do something different. So am I sad? No. Um, I'm actually quite optimistic. Um, and I'm optimistic partly because I'm you know, here in a room of people like this. Great, thanks. Um, you know, when, you're, when you face adversity, when things aren't going totally your way, but you know you've got the right team, you've got people you care about, you know you are working in the right direction, you double down and try to figure out what to do. And I think that's what, as a free software and open source movement, uh, we need to do certainly what Mozilla internally we are doing, looking at how we build on our strengths, our success, and where we want to go. And I feel quite optimistic that we're, we're starting to head in that direction uh, as Mozilla. And just as a little bit of context on my role, I came in uh, in 2008, this was a little bit after I had met Dave when I was at Shuttleworth Foundation, but Mark Shuttleworth, the guy who made Ubuntu, um, really with the goal of reinvigorating the foundation and bringing more participation around Mozilla. And we've started to do that, and I think Mitchell, you know, one of our co-founders, knew we needed to do that in addition to succeed in the market at the time. And since then, separate from Mozilla, although Mozilla playing aside of it, I do think there are a number of things that as the world or the internet has faced more challenges and gotten worse, I think a lot of other things have started to happen that give me hope uh, you know, as, as we kind of move forward. And so one was um, when, how many people know what SOPA PIPA was, which is a sort of legal, Okay, so a bunch of people don't. So I'll have to explain. There was a thing called the Stop Online Privacy Act in the US that almost passed, I don't know, three, four years ago that was going to break DNS and break the internet in a bunch of ways, and was just generally a nasty law, and it almost passed. And Wikipedia, Mozilla, a bunch of the main companies like Google all got involved, including a bunch of us like Wikipedia and Mozilla, basically blacking out our sites in protest. You had never seen ever in the history of the internet that level of consensus and energy on taking on political issues to defend our vision of the internet uh, like you had seen then. It just had not happened till then. Silicon Valley, the kind of hacker community, everyone was galvanized to say, we have to have a political voice if we want to build the vision of the world that we have. So one thing that has happened is the internet has started to find its political voice based on the kind of values I'm talking about and that I think most of us or many of us in this room share. And Mozilla has been a part of that uh, along with others. A another thing that has started to happen, even though it remains nascent, I think it's a lot more like the free software movement was in the 90s, is you, you start to see open hardware in the maker movement. And of course, Raspberry Pi is not fully open hardware. Arduino is. But the idea that literally we want devices that we can all control, or that those who choose to control, is become a much, much bigger thing. Uh, and it's not free software per se. There's a lot of hybrid stuff. There's all kinds of questions about, as you collect data with this, how do we think about data and privacy and private data, and where, how do we think about open source in that environment? But to me, that's a positive trend. When I go to the Maker Faire in New York, as I did about whatever, a month ago, three weeks ago, the number of interesting, hackable board projects, including a $30 build-your-own-phone project, was like quadruple from what I had seen last year. And so there is energy and momentum in things that 
share our values, and that also gives me uh, a lot of hope and a lot of energy, and Mozilla is involved in a lot of those things. And it's not just open hardware, and it's not just the maker movement, it's also people doing open data in science. It's also people doing open education. There's a lot of places where what Stallman thought about and what all of us are involved in is pervading in society in ways that, if it continues, do have that kind of shaping influence that science has had. And just a, a third thing that gives me a little bit of hope, although it's sideways and hard to read, that we made this poster the wrong shape for a slide, um, <laughs> is you know, when we released Firefox 10 last fall, and, and Chris Beard, who's my colleague who runs the, the product side of the organization, came back, we really did say we have to go back out and take a stand. Take a stand that Firefox is about a set of values, is about independence, and we have to start building those ideas more aggressively back into the product. And the product, not just being the desktop browser, but also being on Android and iOS now, and also over time, hopefully being an integrated set of cloud services. So I'm actually quite hopeful, despite where we are, because we see a political voice coming uh, around the internet, which is the movement part. We see innovation happening in all kinds of places, open hardware, open education, open data, and we ourselves, and I think others are as well, stepping back in how do we take those values, those trends, that innovation, and build it into products again that hundreds of millions of people or eventually billions of people will use. Those are the things we all need to be thinking about. So this is just my view. Anybody who has, knows me knows this is what everything looks like in my blog. This is from a blog post this week. What Mozilla needs to do, and I, I think it is you know, something that we all need to do in our own ways, is focus in the next era, so the next five to 10 years, on making open mainstream again, or making open more mainstream, making it be something that not only people, like people in this room, feel and experience. Making it feel like my phone, my thermometer, my data I collect in my science school project, that I understand how the hackability of those things the portability of those things, my control of those things, actually has utility, value, and meaning for me. I think that's what we all need to be focused on, and I do think it is achievable, and I do think it, in aggregate, can put chinks in the armor of the emerging monopolies. And so, concretely, where we are investing energy is really to build out from Firefox, uh, from the base we have, leaning even further back into our values in what we will release over the next couple of years, um, to focus on innovation inside Mozilla where we find the next beachhead. We haven't done that yet with Firefox OS. We may in the second try, we may in IoT, we may in privacy-friendly advertising. If you watch us, you know we're playing in all of those things. Um, but we need to find another place beyond the browser to have relevance and bring our values to the mass market. Uh, and I, I do believe we need a lot of people trying to do that, not just Mozilla. And then the last thing is we need to fuel and be a part of the movement that we were born of and continue to want to be a contributor to better than we have in the last five years. And that's a lot of where my work day to day with the foundation sits, is supporting others who are working in this space. So that's your first glimpse of what I hope will be or is emerging as the Mozilla strategy or where we are headed uh, as a, a group, although we don't quite use those words, my take on it. Um, and just to give you a kind of tiny wrap up and evidence that some of this stuff is happening, you start to see this is our chief counsel and head of business development talking about things like content blocking uh, as we think about product directions and the market. And so we're really trying to move quickly and lean into those topics as they emerge. This is from a few weeks ago. We've just hired a new chief innovation officer who, somebody I love, she's the CEO of a, a big German newspaper, Katarina Burchardt, and are looking at how we reinvest in innovation in an incredibly focused and aggressive way. And she'll join us in January. This is a post from Chris, my colleague who runs the Firefox group. And I am very proud to say, and this is a dip in the bucket for what we should do and I think will do starting next year, we just launched a grant program to support open source projects that Mozilla relies on. So if we draw on your code, uh, we will be giving out a set of grants from a million dollar pool to support those projects. 
Uh, and as I say, I think we want to do more of that. So that is us re-embracing the movement. That is us getting into innovation and us thinking differently again about the product. So I'm hopeful in that. I'm hopeful that in that we can get back on this track. And I'm hopeful in the next 10 years, all of us can be focused on this track. So the work we're doing actually has impact and shapes the world. And I guess I want to finish with one last thought, uh, and then I can open up to, to any questions. For me, the most important part of getting there is people like the people in this room. That leadership, the acts of leadership we all take, whether they are just choosing to use open source in your own projects, whether that's giving code back into a project that you've borrowed from, whether that's building something yourself and releasing it open source, whether it's teaching other people, as many of the, the folks at Seneca do here, whether it's you know, leading the political part of this movement, all of those leaderships in aggregate are needed for us to move the ball along the field and build the world that most of us, many of us want, and certainly that I want to see, which is about a world that Im embeds those ideas of freedom. And so you know, one person I just want to call out uh, here in this picture is my good friend Dave Humphrey, who introduced me. He's hiding, as he often is, back in the corner where you can't see him. Um, and this is Dave receiving an award that was well, well deserved from the Governor General for the work here at Seneca. And I, I think you know, it's such a great example, especially you know, listening to Gideon and Kieran's presentation a few minutes ago, of what we need to do, which is not only ourselves take leadership, but also build other leaders. And so we'll be announcing over the next couple of months a creation of something we'll call the Mozilla Leadership Network, which is really to encourage and recognize people like Dave, people like we work with around the world who are trying to bring others into this movement, help them be effective, and help us actually build our ideas into how the world works. So probably a thank you to Dave. Um, and I do believe that. Um, if we do that, this is Dave now as Isaac Newton. So kind of, uh, but I do believe actually in aggregate these acts add up to this, right? These were normal people. These were normal people who took acts of leadership, who had a belief that something that was very uncommon in the world around them is something that was needed. And I believe that our values of freedom, the pragmatism of it, the poetry of it, the vision of it, is important to humanity. And that the internet we get and the society we get if we don't succeed with those values is not a pretty one. So I believe we can build an amazing future as we lead and lean into the values we have, the software we build, and the people around us. And that is the way we get 350 years of software freedom. Thank you. So I'm happy to take questions. I got close to my 30 minutes. Yes, big hand in the back. Why Shout it out. Why do you not use the Firefox phone? Why have people not bought Firefox phones? It's, it's just, it, why have people not bought Firefox phones? They're not something that is, they're not a great product. To me, my biggest reason was that they've been on such low end hardware and hard to acquire in Canada. Yeah, even if you, I have three. Um, you wouldn't be using it. Um, I mean, and I have Mozilla colleagues in the, in the back who may be upset that I say that, who do use them. But... And so the, you know, the, the thing is, getting into the consumer market is hard. I would say a mistake we made um, was twofold. You said one of them, which was really <laughs> thinking that we could go to the bottom of the market as a market entry strategy. That just didn't work out, right? So people make wrong business bets all the time. The people who were leading that part of the strategy aren't with us anymore. That wasn't the right way to enter the market. It seemed like a reasonable, the reasonable theory at the time. And well, actually, probably there's, there's three things, actually. The other is, you know, we really focused on the engineering side and not the consumer product market fit side. So that's where we're going back. And I think the third thing is, we actually didn't look at our core base, and so by going to the $25 smartphone, we didn't look at whether somebody like you or somebody like me or somebody like Mike want to use in terms of higher end hardware. We pay 600 bucks for an open source phone if it was good, and then that's how you roll it out from there. 
we are going back to that. So some of the current things that we're doing now are <coughs> there is a, a set of projects, including one that basically you can flash an Android phone with lots of different sets of hardware with Firefox OS. So that is something we are leaning back into is start with our base of developers and people who care uh, and grow and make it better from there as opposed to start with people who can't afford a phone, which was the previous strategy. So we're still figuring out how to do that, but they're not great right now. Like that's the fact of the matter. I, I, I would dare anyone in this room, I know all of the most diehard free software people who have tried, including me, to spend months with them, and it, it's, it's not something you want to use. But it, it seems to me sad that every closed environment is now built on open source. So just having, I mean, look at underneath iOS is PSD. Absolutely. Underneath Android, yeah. So it seems like just not having a percentage of the, the percentage of the code base is not how you win. It seems like you have to own the crest. Um, and also, Refighting battles you lost doesn't always work. It seems like picking new areas that haven't been fought before, it, that's not my nature. I'm, I go back and refine things and make them better. But it just looks like the open ground right now might be Internet of Things. And people are desperately trying to close it. If we can only keep it open, it's a win. Servers we want on are close enough to winning, but nothing else. Yeah, so I would say, well, we won some ground in desktop browsers, uh, and, oh, and, right. and encyclopedias we've done well in. Um, <laughs> but OpenStreetMaps is wonderful, and it's not wonderful. Yeah, so, so let me just respond to that. So I don't know if people heard all that to just summarize is, you know, where do we pick our battles next? We, you know, we've won underneath the hood on a bunch of back-end code and on servers. And so I would agree with everything you, you said. And I, I guess the one place I would, would, like, tweak the words is, I don't think that the rest is the crust. I think there's a, a mind shift for those of us who have been in open source for a long time, which I have been, to think about how do we apply our values in other components of it? Because payments is not the crust. Uh, user interface, frankly, is not the crust. The Internet of Things, in fact, it's the last thing of the crust is going to disappear behind our eyes and we're not even going to see it. Um, and so I think we actually have to look at where the power and the control points are which used to be much more at the operating system layer. But the power and the control points are in a bunch of different places now. And that's where, even if people have free software under the hood, they've consolidated at different control points. So Google and Apple have consolidated in software distribution and payments with their stores. You can't install stuff. I mean, it was so, well, certainly if you still use Linux, but even on Windows, it was so normal that you would just get a disk from anybody and, and put a piece of software in. You can't do that here anymore. The control point has moved to the distribution mechanism and the payments, or it's moved to the maps. The reason OpenStreetMaps isn't working is because of licensing and integration into the operating systems, which is where most of the consumer value comes from, as well as all kinds of stuff around how surveillance and data works, which provides us value and also takes away our privacy. So it's that tangled web of, web of things that we have to go and I think focus on and say, where are the control points and where do we take our values where control points either are or, to your point, are likely to emerge. And, and you would not be surprised, don't be surprised if you see us do more in the Internet of Things. The, the guy who's come in, I'm very, very excited about him actually, uh, Ari, I can never pronounce his last name, which is Scandinavian, he's just joining us next month to run what was the Firefox OS group and is now called the Connected Devices group. We're going to take a much more broad view of where we get involved. And part of that's looking is where is their market opportunity, and then also where are the potential future control points that you can disrupt or avoid. So Android does allow you to sideload apps, and you can install alternative yeah, sure. maps and even our app store, and they even allow you to take the OS and roll out your own whatever. So why, can you elaborate on why you think it's a closed system? Yeah, so it allows you to. Um, I mean, how many people, well, it's a bad crowd to ask, but how many people sideload apps on Android on a regular basis? Some. Um, if you actually want to have impact, you have to engage with real consumer behavior. And so they have not made it convenient. So they, it is, I mean, people in Google are big champions of open. So are lots of people on Facebook. I'm not saying they're bad people, they're not open components of it. But it goes to what I just said before. The real control points that actually make it close are not in our normal definition of 
getting software running on a piece of hardware. The real control points are real distribution with convenience has to happen through the Play Store. So unless you're in China where there are alternative Android operating systems or you want to use Android and be on their closed ecosystem, there are no simple consumer distribution mechanisms where there's, um, where there's options. So it is a closed monopoly of software distribution for most people. Um, we could change that. We could go train people to sideload, but it, it's not happening in the market. Uh, and then similarly with things like Maps, all of the real value, I mean, I use it all the time. I don't want to get off Google Maps because all of the real value has to do with being tied into all the other Google Play services and all of the data that's being collected around my identity. That's not bad, I get value from it, but do we have alternatives to that that are more open and put us more in control? I don't know, maybe not, but it is at this point a, a closed system and a monopoly. And that's to do more with the choice that people make on the point of Google not letting that happen. Well, that's, that's the same as, as saying, you know, there was a Mozilla suite and an alternative operating, or alternative browser to Internet Explorer since 1998. People didn't use it, it didn't have any impact on the world. So, I mean, the Mozilla position, certainly my position is, you know, why I talk about innovation product and movement is the innovation on its own and the ability for some set of very technically and motivated people to do something isn't enough to have impact on the world. You need also mass market product based on the same, uh, on the same set of values. And the measure of mass market products having impact is our large numbers of people using them. And large numbers of people are not sideloading on Android. Why should, why or how, and why would the mass market ever care about being able to open up their phone and, or whatever device? People don't want to open up their car. People don't want to open, like mass market things are not open source things. They're merchandised commercial things. So, you know, is it, you know, tilting against windmills, even thinking we can enter into the mass market universe with open source philosophies? Well, we've done it at least twice with Firefox and Wikipedia. So those are very mainstream things that people use every day that are open and that are under threat. So like, I, I believe you can play in the market with but a different set of values. They aren't using Mozilla because it's open. Well, they're not. So the, the, there's a different debate about whether you can make open things that have consumer relevance. But what we do know from brand research from both us and Wikipedia is that people do perceive that it is different than corporate. Uh, and that there is some internet-y values thing there. So the thing of manufacturing or understanding people, what people start to internalize emotionally about what is good about the kind of internet that we want versus the kind of internet we don't is like a whole sort of public education challenge is the reason I work so much on the public education side. So people emote that in large tens of millions or small hundreds of millions. Like there's something different there, I want it. Can they describe open? Not, probably not most of them, still large numbers of them. Um, so I, I guess that's a, a, not a thing of can a consumer product be open, it's what does it mean for people, how do they make those choices? And it's probably closer to organic food in terms of that challenge of how do you get people to make different choices that then influence market behavior, that then influence at the substrate of how the actual power works. You already went. Yeah. Somebody else? Okay, so going back to the Firefox phones, or Firefox OS. Um, so obviously the, the $25 smartphone thing for Indonesia didn't really pan out. Maybe. Um, it did work in Africa a little bit. But. You talked about going for the more premium segments and maybe try to sell $600 phones here or in Europe. This reminds me of Ubuntu Edge, which also didn't pan out. They tried crowdfunding it. And they even had the same thing with Ubuntu Touch ROMs for Android devices. That's not really working out for them. So, what are your thoughts on how Firefox could fight that same battle and maybe this time's way? So, so, I'll say two, two things. One is just to be more specific about what I said, really, it's an experimental thing we're doing right now, not a big business strategy to make it easy for developers to help us improve and play with the system by getting it on higher end hardware. So, it's not a $600 consumer device. It's at this point, the ability for you to flash a device at $600 and have a good experience, um, really as a developer engagement piece. But that's our base of, of supporters. So partly it's about getting it into the hands of our base of supporters, seeing where they want to go as an open innovation 
experiment. It's not a market play at this stage. And I would say on the market play, like if we're just honest, we don't know yet. Like we, we didn't succeed in the first kick of the can. Happens a lot to people. We're being honest enough to say, we need to come back and re-strategize. It's why Ari is joining us. It's why we have a chief innovation officer. We have to figure out where, to this gentleman's point, where are the open places in the market where our, we, we are a very literal double bottom line company on the corporate side, which is to say, where can we deliver something that large numbers of people want that will be a vector for the delivery of our values? And we will not build something that can't succeed on both of those things. And we don't know what that is right now. We're working on it. So if you have an idea. Maybe one more question. This gentleman in the back has his hand very high. He has his uh, just an observation uh, for Mozilla and really the whole movement. Uh, Bitcoin, like finance is really what drives everything, right? And Bitcoin, I feel like it still doesn't get the respect among the open source community. It really deserves because it's the true open source movement and it's really the biggest threat in a way to the systems which are holding us down in those terms. So people use Bitcoin, you know, integrate it into your apps. Mozilla Firefox should have integration with Bitcoin. Like you should be able to just transact directly through the browser. I mean, imagine that's not so <coughs> difficult to pull off. Yeah, so I would agree. I, I would, could have put Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies up instead of open hardware as a thing that gives me optimism. So, and I do think you're right, it doesn't get the respect uh, that it deserves. There's also all kinds of complicated questions around cryptocurrencies, but for sure there's a, a lot of potential space and a vector there. Uh, we do take donations by Bitcoin, if you want to transact with <laughs> Mozilla by Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, I, I would agree. Um, and then just to, to just finish up, it speaks to the point that what we have to be looking at is where do our values interact with the, the places where control exists in the digital world. Because the digital world will be the world, for us, already is the world all of us live in. It will be the world in which all of humanity lives in, in a very short amount of time. So if we're, if we're concerned about power, not everybody is, I am, how power works in the digital world, including money, is an important issue. And the work that we all do can shape where that goes. So with that, thanks for inviting me, Chris. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Just wanted to uh, say thanks on Thank behalf you. of the organizers and all of the audience here. I think uh, one thing I'll say just to wrap up uh, our time here for this keynote is that working open and includes honesty. It's about when things work, when they don't work. Uh, I've always enjoyed that about Mark, like being able to say, this is where we're doing well, this is where we want to improve. I think that's a really good ethic uh, to model out. So thanks for coming and being, uh, being a model for us today. Anyway, thanks for coming. And thank you. Lunches in the same place as last time you go.